So what we're studying tonight is part two of what does it mean to be saved in the dispensation of grace? So we're not focusing on how to get it saved because we've covered that in so many different lessons. We're focusing on what does it mean to be saved in the dispensation of the grace of God. There are three promises from God encompassing what it means to be saved. It's not just the first thing, which is that you are saved or delivered from certain conditions. So as we read, you're delivered from certain conditions. It's not just that, it is that you're also blessed with other things. So that's number two. And number three, you are secure in Christ. You have this eternal security in Christ that accompanies the two other things. So the first, the first promise from God is that when you're saved, you are delivered or saved from a number of different conditions. And we discussed that last week, and I'll get into that again. But the second thing about being saved is all these blessings that God has for you. Never neglect those. They're part of the hope of the gospel, the certainty of what God is going to do with you, what he's blessed you with. So, for example, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ he's blessed you with. He's also made you a joint heir with God. You cannot imagine having a greater blessing than God Almighty, who owns everything, is sharing everything with you as a joint heir with him. The third main thing is you have eternal security in Christ so that you can know you're saved. God defines you as being a saved, sealed, forgiven, justified, glorified, sanctified, redeemed person that can know, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that when you die, you have a body that God has made for you. Eternal in the heavens, you can know that. You should know that. You should dwell on that. You should be excited about that. You should be excited because we're going to talk about this later. Death is the greatest thing. The death of this body is the greatest thing that can happen to us. Because we're going to leave the corruptible. We're going to leave the vile body. And we're going to be translated. We're going to be transferred into the glorious body. Why do you not want to be in the glorious body? Why do you want to cling on to this body? Why are people afraid of death to save people? We should not be. We should be so happy. Thank God I'll be out of this into the glorious body. What do some of them not like the glorious body that God says is going to be fashioned like his glorious body and they want to stay in this painful thing? we got to think about that. God wants you to set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. And how do you do that? By reading his word and reading about the glorious body he's going to give you. By reading about the resurrection. By reading about being a joint heir with him. Studying those things. There's so much on them. In this study, we barely, this is the tip of the iceberg. We don't get into great depth. We kind of summarize things. But I want you to think about this. So, getting back to number one, what did we say from? Well, we studied that last week. We noticed the Bible used the word delivered interchangeably with saved. And remember how several lessons ago, some of you might remember how in the beginning chapters of the epistles of Paul, God establishes you in his love, in his security, and his promises. You might remember that. But normally the first chapter of one of the epistles, you get all these incredible promises. Well, last week we learned that God in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, that God delivered us from so great a death. He delivered us from what is, I believe, looking at so great a death, it's an eternal death. That's what being saved, one of the biggest things that saved is about. You're delivered from an eternal death. We also saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that we, are, we have been delivered from the wrath to come, that God 
Jesus Christ delivered us from God's righteous and holy wrath. We studied that last week. God's wrath is not arbitrary. God's wrath is not capricious. It is not unjust. It is perfectly just. And one day there's going to be a revelation of the righteous judgment of God. We read about that in Romans 2. God is going to reveal to everybody that ever lived how righteous his judgment is. He's going to be completely justified when he judges people. And people are going to see it because he's, there's an absolute perfection mathematically with the crime against God is going to be perfectly matched with the punishment. He's going to render to every man according to his deeds. Now, those that have trusted Christ, that's the other great thing about being delivered from and being in the safe condition. He has delivered us from the penalty of our sin. Our crimes against God have been paid for according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We have forgiveness of sins through the riches of his grace. According to Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. So that's the other thing that we're saved from, the penalty of our sin. We also read last week, we studied last week, that he's delivered us from this present evil world. In Galatians 1, verse 4. So the course of this world is to the broad path of destruction. It is filled with the ungodly. It is filled with those that hate God. It is filled with his enemies. And those are the people he died for. Never forget that. And he, we read about last week how he wants to, through his forbearance and his love and his long-suffering, those three things are in Romans. He leads people to repentance. He turns them to the gospel. And then at one point, some point in time, they don't want to retain God in his knowledge. In their knowledge, they don't want, they worship the creature. They hate God, and it gets to the point where he gives them up. He gives them up to their own reprobate mind. But what we learned was that he wants everyone to be saved. His will is that all be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. You read in the uh, book of Second Peter how he doesn't, he's not willing that any should perish. That's not his will. He's working on every person in this world, I'm convinced, man, woman, and child, until it gets to the point where they just completely don't want him anymore, and he gives them up to reprobate one. Not that they can't repent and get saved, but that's the nature of his judgment in Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 1. They get to the point where they're treasuring up to themselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. But we learned... Never forget this. Your condition as a saved person is he delivered you from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians 1.10. He, much more now by his blood, okay, through his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, Romans 5.9. So that condition that this present evil world is going to, that he rescued us from this present evil world. He delivered us from the present evil world, Galatians 1.4. We're not going there anymore with them. We're part of the church, which is his body. They're going one way, we're going the other way. They're going towards destruction, we're going toward everlasting glory. And that's what we're saved to, the everlasting glorious body that God has prepared for us. Now, the other thing we looked at last week was he's delivered us from the power of darkness. And he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Now, the most fundamental thing I think that we're saved from, other than the wrath of God, which is, it's, it's co-fundamental with being saved from what? Being saved from death. Being saved from death is the core of salvation. Now, it is not the death of this body. No, because we have to get out of this body to inherit the kingdom of God. We have to leave this body to get into the glorious body. No, that's not what it is. Now, I imagine during the rapture, yes, there are going to be people that are alive, they're going to be raptured out. 
these bodies are not going to be the ones that are raptured out. They're going to be raptured in a moment. They're going to be changed into a glorious body. So these are not going there either for those that are alive during the rapture. And those that die in Christ are referred to as asleep in Christ. They're the dead in Christ. Over and over again, God refers to them as asleep. And what's going to happen to them? They're going to be raised immortal, incorruptible, and glorious. No, the death we've been delivered from, the death we've been saved from, is the condition of being a dead soul in a body of death. The Bible has dead souls in bodies of death that go into eternity that way and stay that way eternally. They don't have life anymore. We're going to look at this topic. I think it's important to know that I'm saved from being a dead soul. Why? I have life in Christ. Even when we're asleep in Christ, we're going to be absent from this body. We're going to be present with the Lord. And we're going to be very much alive. We're always going to be alive. Yes, you're dead in Christ, but you're referred to as asleep in Christ. You are in Christ. You're in that glorious body, I believe. And you're going to be raised in that glorious body. You're in the presence of God. There is no death there. You're not dead. You're dead, but you're in Christ, and so you're alive. Our death is very much different from the death of a lost person or a person that is in a different category to where people go when they die. They don't all go just to be with the Lord or go right to hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. They're the dead, they're the dead that are in the sea. They're the dead that are in death. They're the dead that are in hell. They're different places where God puts dead people, dead souls, I should say. But one thing is that is clear about us. We are once we're absent from this body, we're dead. Uh, this body ends. We go to our glorious body to be raised in that glorious body. We go to be raised in the glorious body. If I die right now, I will be raised in the glorious body at the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, those that are alive during the rapture, they're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And then so shall they ever be with the Lord. But let's take a look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What are we saved from? What well, we're saved from this condition of a dead soul in a body of death. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, and that's his body here, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. How does somebody know that if they, if they don't have eternal security? How can they say, I shall bear the image of the heavenly? This is a promise of God to the believer of the gospel that he pointed out in verses 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. This is the same chapter that presents the gospel in verses 1 through 4. Well, well here... That believer in the gospel can say with all 100% security, I shall bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why we have to leave these bodies. We have to leave these bodies to inherit the kingdom of God. You can't inherit it in these bodies. We have to be raised in our glorious bodies. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. That lasts forever. That doesn't decay over there. That doesn't end. That body doesn't end. You can't inherit the incorruptible kingdom of God in a corruptible body. And here's the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. And by the way, it's called a mystery. That's why I believe the rapture, there's a pre- Tribulational rapture, one of the reasons. The scripture refers to it as a mystery. But the second coming of Christ and the resurrection at the second coming of Christ, that was not a mystery. That was never a mystery. It's in the Bible all the way through the Old Testament prophets. There would be a resurrection of Israel in the book of Ezekiel. Those dry bones would come together and they'd be raised to their land. 
It's in the book of Daniel. We'll take a look at that. The eternal life is there in the Old Testament. The resurrection at the return of the Messiah is in the Old Testament. But this here is a mystery. Behold, I do you a mystery, verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You see what we're going to be raised? We're going to be raised, how we're going to be raised? Incorruptible. How quickly will it happen in the twinkling of an eye? That quickly, as quickly as you can blink your eye. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So we're raised immortal. We are saved from the condition of being a dead soul in a body of death. No, we are never in a body of death. In that we're in this corruptible now, yes, but when we die, we go to be with the Lord. And we are in our body that God made for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, immortal in the heavens. And then that is a body, the glorified body, that we are raised in, incorruptible. And we are raised immortal in that body. We will never die. We will never decay. We can't suffer a scratch, a sickness, a tear, or a pain. We will be incapable of suffering pain, sorrow, or anything bad. We're, we will be completely incorruptible. Disease is a form of corruption. A scratch is a form of corruption. It's just your body that can be broken, that can be cut, that can be uh, hurt, that suffers pain. No, you will never have had that ever again, forever. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, verse 54, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up, swallowed up in victory. And there's a saying, and it's from the book of Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us, notice giveth us victory, it's a gift through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to verse 25. You see, he gives us a victory. He defeated death because death is his enemy. Death is an enemy of God. Adam and Eve were not designed and created by God to die. They chose death. So did our ancestors. So did the people when Jesus Christ came near to the earth. So did the people when the prophets of Israel and when God revealed himself to Israel. Those people chose death. They didn't want God. They wanted to worship satanic idols. Our ancestors didn't want God. They wanted to worship satanic idols. The Gentiles fell in unbelief. The children of Israel fell in unbelief. All these ancestors for all these people groups, a bunch of idolaters and child murderers. Is what they were, and they'd worship their idols by killing children. That's what they were. They wanted the death culture. They don't want the life culture. It's like people today. They want the death culture. Okay? In the United States, they murdered over 50 million babies in abortion. That's a death culture. It's not a life culture. They're a bunch of hypocrites is what they are. But here's the point. God did not create mankind to die. He created him to live forever. There was a tree of life in that garden for a reason. I'm not going to get into that in detail, but you saw the death that sin caused in the Garden of Eden. There was also the tree of eternal life in the Garden of Eden. You saw the promise of the Jesus Christ right there at the beginning of Genesis, who was going to bless the world, and he was going to undo the, the damage that had been done by evil and wicked men and evil and wicked fallen angels. You saw it all the way through. Well, this is the Lord Jesus Christ here that gives us the victory through what he did on the cross. Now, what did he also do? See, as far as we're concerned, he defeated his enemy. He was victorious over his enemy. 
What is his enemy in verse 25 and 26? Let's read about it. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is his enemy. He doesn't like death. He hates death. He wants everybody to be saved. He has no pleasure, the Bible says, in the death of a sinner. He has no pleasure in that. So he destroyed his enemy, death, and gave us the victory through his work at Calvary and in the dispensation of grace we just accepted by faith. And it's a done deal, his work, finished work on the cross. But you know who has power over death? Who was given by God the power over death? Satan was given the power over death. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 2, verse 14, you don't have to turn there, but Satan had the power of death. And Satan was given, uh, these angels, by the way, had all kinds of power and authority that rebelled against God. They were given free will, they rebelled against God. They had all kinds of, of thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. That's what they're called, because God gave them all those things. When they rebelled against God, he transferred all of that to Jesus Christ. But they can still exercise those powers. Satan still has power over death. Satan still uh, has power to deceive. Satan will, Satan will have power in the Great Tribulation to kill the saints. I'm sure he does today. They're exercising the power, and Jesus Christ is not exercising all that power yet. It was stripped from the enemy legally by the work of Christ at the cross. It is not effectively going to be an operation until Christ returns and cleanses the earth and until the heavens are cleansed. They have to be physically fumigated by God and his angels up in heaven. We might have a part in that. And God has to come back here and fumigate the earth of all the evil that are all over the world. So he has to exercise that power to destroy all the evil yet. It will happen. It will come. Now, I want us to think about something. This is something where there is a description. I'm, I'm, I'm discussing this body, this death that we have been delivered from, the condition of being dead, the condition of being a dead soul with a dead body. And it's described in the Old Testament. It's described in the New Testament. You could read about it in places like the Book of Revelations. But I think a good place to see it Kind of a picture of it is Isaiah 14. Why don't you turn to Isaiah chapter 14? Start in about verse 12. Isaiah 14. To get a context, what are we reading about? Well, we're reading about the fall of Satan. And we're reading about him in hell. And we're reading about other people in hell. And they all have bodies of death. They are souls that are dead. And they have bodies of death in hell. Now, if you don't have a King James, I'm sorry for you. Because his name is taken out of there in verse 12. You won't find the word Lucifer in those other Bibles, I think, for the most part. Maybe there are some that do. But in the NIV, NAS, uh, uh, New, New English Standard, all these Bibles... They don't have the word Lucifer. It's taken out. And at some point in Isaiah 14, they substitute a name for Jesus Christ, um, the morning, uh, the bright and more, the morning star. They substitute that for a name for Satan. And that's one of the reasons that I stayed away from those Bibles. I saw that in Isaiah 14. And I thought, wow, they're taking Lucifer's name out and they're substituting a name for Jesus Christ in there, not in verse 12, but in another place there. I thought, I don't want to have anything to do with those Bibles. I'm going to stick with this one that has to write it. But give you a context, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? It starts with the king of Babylon. It's clearly referring to Lucifer. There you see it. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Those have to do with the angels of God. He wanted to exalt himself above God's angels. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now, here's the thing. I will be like the most high. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to sit as God. 
The Antichrist is going to sit at the temp in the temple of God, showing himself to the world that he is God. But no, okay. What is going to happen to Satan at the end of the tribulation? An angel is going to come down and put him in hell. The pit and hell are synonymous. The bottomless pit is the same as hell. And hell is the same as bottomless pit. Pit, how do I know that? Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That's where he's taken in Revelations. That's where he's taken here. That is where he's going to be chained and brought down there by a, an angel of God at the end of the tribulation when Christ returns. He's going down to hell. He's going down to the pit. And those that see him down there, the dead souls that are in hell, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened up the house of his prisoners? They're talking about Satan. So I want you to back up to verse 9. And if you can, hold on, look, I, I want you to see something very interesting about this, okay? If you hold on to 1 Corinthians 15, get that in one hand, and we'll stay here in, um, uh, in uh, Isaiah 14, but I want you to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 as well, and look at about verse 42, and I want you to notice something. And I'm going to be reading from both places. So I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 15, around verse 42. I believe that in 1 Corinthians 15, that, that there's, there's a picture of the dead there, that what you are delivered from, in effect, um, as a resurrected person. But it seems like the dead souls with their dead bodies are in the condition of the dead as described in 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe not entirely, but partially. Here's what I mean. Verse 9 of Isaiah, chapter 14. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. So they're dead, all these dead that are in hell, they're dead souls. Even all the chief ones of the earth, there are hierarchies in hell. There are left, worse places in hell and better places in hell. It's hell, but there's the lowest hell and there's those that go to the lowest hell and there's levels of punishment that God has. His righteous judgment and punishment, perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly just. But he has different levels in there. Now he stirs up the dead, showing their conscience. They're, they are conscious there, the, the dead. Even all the chief ones of the earth. It had raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So they have thrones down there, kings of the nations, down there in hell. And they shall speak and say unto thee. So these dead souls can communicate. Art thou also become weak as we? So they're saying to Satan, you become weak like us. These dead souls are weak. They don't weld power. They're not down there partying like these people say, oh, I'm going to party with all my friends in hell. No, you're not going to have any Budweiser's in your hand. You're going to be a weak person, okay, that's down there in a body of death. But notice they say to him, Art thou also become weak as we? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, and don't turn back and forth, you, those of you that have your Bible can turn there and hold on to Isaiah uh, 14. And it says about those that are uh, the, the death and the resurrection, it contrasts that death is sown in weakness. But the resurrected body is raised in power. See, the dead souls get the weakness of death. They are not raised in power. They stay weak, just like Satan is there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43 proclaims, 
that death is sown in weakness. They stay weak. But the resurrected soul, we will be raised in power. The other thing is death is sown in corruption. It's sown in decomposition. It's sown in a rotting body. It's sown as a dead body. They stay in that uh, condition of death. These souls are in a body of death. How do I know that? Well, you read on. Verse 10, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. He's a musical creature, Satan. He projects his music, I don't know, all over heaven maybe now, and around the earth. So he's musical. He uses music for his purposes. But when he's down there, all that pomp of his and his vials, they go down to the grave, they go down into hell, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Jesus Christ taught about hell. He said, it's where the worms dieth not, and the fires are not quenched. Jesus Christ taught us about that. There are worms there that don't die. Why? Their corruptible condition in the bodies of death and hell continue. They are rotting in there. They are covered with worms that don't die. He will be covered with these worms. He will have worms underneath him, and he will be covered with worms. The corruptible stays corruptible down there. 1 Corinthians 15 says that death is sown in corruption. They stay in that corruption. They're decomposing down there continually. It is sown in corruption, verse 42. It is raised in incorruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. He is in a state of corruption. And others are as well. Jesus Christ refers to them. As their worm, their worm dieth not. Those that are in hell, the ungodly, their worm dieth not. And it's very interesting. You could see that it's in dishonor. Uh, it's sown in dishonor. They are in, in dishonor. In the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, um, it is sown in dishonor. They are in a condition of dishonor. They're honorable. They're weak. They're corrupting. They are not happy there. Uh, an example is Luke in, in, in the book of Luke, the rich man. Well, where it refers to, you don't have to turn there, but Luke 16, you can look at that starting at about verse 23. He is in torment there. He is in dishonor there. He is not in a good condition there. So that's what their condition is going to be like when they're in these bodies. Of, now, the, the rich man uh, in the book of Luke, in hell, he can speak. He has a body. He has a body that is in torment. He can think. Um, he can see. So they're able to look upon Satan when he comes down there. They can see down there. That's what the body of death is like. Okay? That's what we're saved from. Thank God we're not going to ever suffer any of that. We are, hell is a wrath of God. Okay? That's what it is. It's for people that are suffering his wrath. We are delivered from that. We are not part of that. We are not going there. We're not going to suffer that. And thank God we're not going to suffer that. But keep that in mind when you think of how you've been saved from death. You're, you're saved from this condition of not having light, being a dead soul. And that's what you're saved from. And I think, I think it's, it's very important that when you discuss the wrath of God and his judgment, you should convey to people what God teaches about it. And what I mean by that is you should do it carefully, but you have to be faithful to his word. The one size doesn't fit all, okay? You, you can't say the wrath of God is going to be like this for everyone. Rather, go to his word, study what it's going to be like. Understand first and foremost, it is just, it is a revelation of his righteous judgment. He is just, mankind is not. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be absolutely the perfection of justice. 
So start from that point. And then you study and see what is he going to do to people? Where are they going? What is the crime and what is the punishment that he's going to give to people? And there are a lot of verses on that that you can study. But be careful when you refer to those things. Uh, make sure that you are accurate and present what God teaches about it and not some slogan that people pick up and just spew out. Be faithful to the word of God in everything, including when you're discussing his wrath. Now, I notice that the way the Bible presents and God presents condition of saved people in the Old Testament and the New Testament is in contrast to the ungodly. So you have a picture of here's what happens to the ungodly, here's what happens to the saved. Is a contrast between the saved and the ungodly to show you sort of what you're saved from. Show you this is what you receive, this, this is what they're going to receive. And so that gives you an idea um, in, in understanding, well, what is my position as a saved person? What, what is, does it mean for me to be a saved person? You know, what am I delivered from? And you can look at the contrast, and we're in that category, we're in the, the, one of the, the one promises of God that we are delivered from the bad things, we're in that category. We're not looking necessarily at the blessings. We talked about the blessings, such as all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ and being a joint heir with Christ and the eternal security in Christ. We talked about that. But let's look at some verses that contrast the ungodly and those that are going to suffer God's just punishment with those that God gives eternal life to, with those that are written in the book of life. Because ultimately, God is a book. You can read about it back there in Exodus. You can read about it in the book of Revelations called the book of life. And that book of life has those that have eternal life in it. And Moses talked with God about that book. Moses said, if you're not going to forgive, when the children of Israel were rebelling against God, you're not going to forgive them, then take me out of your book that you've written. And God said, those that sin against me, I'm going to take out of my book. That's a bit of a paraphrase, but that's what God said to him, basically. And then you read about the book of life in the book of Revelations. This book of life is a book of eternal life. In the book of Revelation, you read about those that are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So the book of life is the key book that God keeps. And in there are written the names of those, as Paul referred to those women that helped him in the ministry. He said their names are written in the book of life. So you see it in the epistles, you see it in Revelation, you see it in the Old Testament. But now I want to look at a contrast, contrasting the saved with the lost. And you get a better understanding of what you're saved, what you're saved from. So let's look at the epistles, let's look at the Old Testament on this. I'm not going to go on that long tonight, but let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Why don't we actually start in verse 17? I always like to go to verse 17 because it shows us that our apostle, our minister, our teacher, our preacher, that Jesus Christ sent to the Gentiles, was not sent to baptize. And that's not what this topic is about. But we need to be reminded of that in the event that we're inclined to go and water, want to water baptize people. Because if the apostle that was sent to you as a Gentile and the minister and preacher and teacher of Jesus Christ that was sent to you was not sent to baptize, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, then why do you think you should be going around water baptizing? So verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Two different things, water baptism and the gospel of grace. It has no water in it. Show me water baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Show me water baptism in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, in Titus 3, 5, any of those passages. It's not there. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Two different things. They're often confused with each other in this day and age. 
not with wisdom of words. So you're to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now here we see the contrast between the lost and the saved. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Their condition is what? They're perishing. But unto us which are saved, you can know you're saved, there's the eternal security of the saved person. You can know you're saved. The third main promise of God to us is this eternal security that nothing will separate us from his love, that we are saved. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. See, God's power saved us. So it's nothing we can undo. The word unsaved is not found in the epistles of Paul. The concept of once you're saved, you lose your salvation under certain conditions. It's not found in the epistles of Paul. It doesn't state anywhere there that a saved person then will, can lose their salvation based on something they've done. That is not there. It's written into that. It's read into there, I should say, not written in there. It's read into there by people that want to transplant their doctrines from their church and from their uh, uh, denominational system in the epistles of Paul. They try to force it in there. It won't work in there. There's too many verses that defeat that. But here's the point of this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Those are the ones that are not saved. They're perishing. What does it mean to perish? It means their life is ending and they won't have any more life. They're going to be like the dead souls in hell. Their life is evaporating. It's perishing. It's like a perishable commodity on the grocery store shelf. They have a shelf life of life. It's running out. They've rejected the preaching of the gospel. It's foolish to them. They perish because the life that they have is going to end and they will have no more life. They will only have death. It's to them that perish foolishness. Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And as far as knowing you are saved, the same concept or the same word actually. And the fact that you are saved is in, you can write these down really quickly, Ephesians chapter 2, in two different places, I believe it's verse 5 and obviously verse 8 and 9. It's in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And it's in several other places you can see that same um, terminology of how you are saved. You're not waiting to be saved, you are saved. But let's take another look at this, a contrast from the Old Testament. Go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And look at verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. That's a great tribulation. That's a time of trouble. Tribulation is trouble. This is the worst time ever in the history of the world. And Jesus Christ taught about that in Matthew 24, and he called it great tribulation. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Notice the same word that we saw in four different verses concerning our position as saved people. We're delivered from wrath. We're delivered from the present evil world. We're delivered uh, from the power of darkness. We're um, delivered. Well, here, at that time, thy people, Israel, the people of Israel, shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. There's a book of life. Those of Israel found written in the book of life are going to be delivered. Revelations proclaims all those, by the way, makes it clear that those that are not written in the book of life are taking the mark of the beast. And only those that are written in the book of life are not going to. And by the way, I want to also, I, I mentioned the mark of the beast in the past. The mark of the beast, it's, it's not just you're damned if you take the mark. If you worship the beast, you're damned. 
If you worship his image, you're damned. There's a whole of things associated with him that if you do any of those, the Bible indicates the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. There's an example of lost people of what you're saved from is these people, they are tormented forever and ever. That's what it says about them. You are safe from that condition of those that take the mark of the beast because you're delivered from the wrath to come. But here, let's read this again. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Now, notice it doesn't say they're in hell, but it says they sleep in the dust of the earth. Now, I think it might be some in hell, some in death, or in the sea and these other places where God has souls. Everyone that shall be found written in the book are delivered. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here are those who get everlasting life, the ones written in the book. Here are the, and the resurrected, right, to everlasting life. But some are going to experience shame and everlasting contempt. They don't get everlasting life. These, I believe, stay as dead souls and dead bodies and bodies of death. These are ones that don't want to be with God. They chose to follow another God, and they're going to go where their God is in the place prepared by God Almighty for uh, the devil and his angels. It's explaining that those places were prepared for the devil and his angels. And I think I just, okay, I don't know what happened. I, I lost my screen there for a second. But here's the contrast, everlasting life versus shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament Sounds like a glorified body, doesn't it? Shining is the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. See the condition of those that get everlasting life? See the condition of the saved? They're glorified here forever and ever, shining like the stars. Shining is the brightness of the firmament. And what it means, everlasting contempt and shame, it's not explained right here in, uh, in Daniel 12 or where exactly they're going. But it is explained in other places in the Bible. We just read about it in, in uh, Revelations chapter 14. Let's take a look at another one of these. If you go to Matthew 25, we looked at this, um, I believe, in the last study or the previous one. But there's this other contrast that you see. And I'm about to end it pretty soon. I know it's the time's almost up. So this contrast that you see in Matthew 25, verse 46. There are the righteous and there are the wicked. The wicked go into everlasting punishment. These wicked that are referred to in Matthew 25 go into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. There you see it again. You see the contrast. You learn something about the lost condition. You see something about the righteous judgment of God, that the wicked get everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. One more, and then we're going to end it for the night. Go to John 3.36. We looked at this passage as well, but I want you to think about it in light of a contrast. John 3 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. They don't see life, they stay dead. We are saved from so great a death. This is that great death that God saved us from. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, this great death where you don't have life anymore. Their life has perished out of them. Their life has been sucked out of them. They decide to be wicked and evil and reject God Almighty. God, I'm sure, drew them to repentance through his long suffering. 
through his goodness and his forbearance, according to Romans 2. He wasn't willing that any of these people perish, according to, I believe, it's 2 Peter. He wanted them all to be saved. That was his will. But they chose by their hard and impenitent heart, according to Romans, to reject God. They hate God. They don't want to be with him, and they don't like his people. So, okay, there's a place for you. God has a place for you, but you don't have life there. You're not going to see life. You're going to suffer what you justly deserve. The wrath of God is going to abide on you. Okay? And I know there's a lot of teachings. People say that some people are annihilated. There's some scriptures that seem to support that some people, their memory is gone forever. Nobody ever remembers them. It's like they never existed. Their names are blotted out of heaven. Nobody remembers who they were, what they were, or the places in the earth that are named after them. So I understand that. But the Bible clearly teaches also that they're those that are going to not see life, but God's wrath is going to abide on them. And we read about them uh, having everlasting shame and contempt. Uh, and they suffer the wrath of God uh, forever. We read about those that, that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. I think you need to, the good thing to do, if you want to study this further, look at the condition of somebody where, and see what the punishment is that God renders to them in, in different parts of the Bible. Like we know in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when God, when Christ returns, the ungodly, I think those are the same as those that receive the mark of the beast. What it says about them there is they suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. So everlasting destruction is their fate when Jesus Christ returns and he takes vengeance on the ungodly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, it's, it's where that is explained um, that, that, um, that they have, um, that they suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory uh, of his power. In flaming fire, taking vengeance, in verse 8, on them that know not God and that obey not the Lord, uh, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall pun be punished with everlasting destruction, verse 9, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And we're distinguished there. We are distinguished there. Right there in those verses in 2 Thessalonians 1. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, that's us. And to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. What is the testimony among them? The gospel, the grace of God. The gospel, the grace of God was believed by these people. Therefore, these people are not suffering the wrath of God. We're not going to suffer the wrath of God. God is going to glorify himself in us. So that's where I want to end it.